Since William Reutgen discovered X-rays in 1895, it's been possible to use this form of penetrating ionizing radiation to look inside the body as part of medical investigations. X-ray examination of the horse became a part of investigation of lameness after the Second World War. Battlefield conditions and the need for field hospitals had driven along the development of portable X-ray equipment, and after the war the surplus equipment found its way into equine practice. Its use has gradually increased until it's now become almost a routine part of lameness investigation in the horse. In 1999, new regulations governing the use of x-rays in veterinary practice came into force, with some important changes. These regulations reinforced the 1985 ruling that manual restraint of small animals for radiography was no longer acceptable, and that anaesthesia or sedation in combination with positioning aids was now required. In equine practice, because of the logistic problems and the risks of general anaesthesia, manual restraint of the patient is still allowed. There just isn't any other practical way of taking radiographs of an animal the size of the horse without the use of people, not only to restrain the patient himself, but also to hold the imaging cassette and position and control the x-ray set. The 1999 regulations also made changes to the qualifications needed to act as a radiation protection advisor, the person who advises the practice on the safe use of radiation within the clinic and on the necessary rules and regulations. It also introduced for the first time a mandatory requirement for all x-ray machines to be fitted with a light beam diaphragm. Because of the inherent risks involved in radiography, it is essential that a safe set of working practices are designed and adopted to ensure that staff are protected and that their radiation doses are kept to an absolute minimum. This introduces the gold standard concept in radiation safety, the ALARP principle. The letters stand for as low as reasonably practicable. This axiom determines that if it's possible to alter working practices in a way that will reduce the dose, then the alteration must be made, as long as it is one which is practically achievable. One of the problems with radiation is that despite its inherent potential for damage, it's impossible to see, feel or smell these rays, so we can't be directly aware of any exposure. In fact, in the early days, people were so blasé about their use that Ronken even took a, an x-ray of his wife's hand, complete with wedding ring, as a demonstration. Gradually, though, people became aware that these rays were damaging to tissues, but not before many early radiographers had lost one or more of their fingers from holding the x-ray cassettes with their fingers in the primary beam. The effects of radiation are cumulative, so a small dose repeated over a long period of time can be just as harmful as one single large dose. There are two main effects of radiation damage. In the first type, called the deterministic effect, there is direct physical damage to the tissues. This can result in reddening, or even death of the skin, and in damage to the hair follicles, resulting in hair loss. This kind of damage is similar in concept to the direct damage we get from strong sunlight, which is also the result of burning by rays, in this case, ultraviolet rays. This is a less damaging form of radiation, but one that we have to take seriously nonetheless. The second result is called the stochastic effect. In this case, the cells under radiation bombardment are also damaged, but unlike in the deterministic effect, they don't die, they're simply damaged and changed. This is usually by sublethal damage to the DNA, the cell's blueprint for life, which is kept in the nucleus. This is the type of damage that can later increase the chance of these cells becoming malignant, contributing to cancer. Or, in the same way, the sperm and eggs can be damaged in the stochastic effect, which can lead to the development of birth defects in the offspring, often long after the initial radiation exposure took place. Much of the knowledge on the doses needed to produce these effects is still evolving. A lot of the original data came from survivors of the atomic bombs. Here, scientists knew the dose of radiation which people at every distance from the explosion would have received. They were then able to compare the cancer and birth defect rates in those people with the control population. 
to get an idea of the effect of each dose level. All the studies since then have resulted in a general trend of lowering the doses which we consider safe. The dose received affects the probability of developing diseases such as cancer. The cells most at risk from radiation are rapidly dividing cells, such as those in the bone marrow, the gut lining and the developing human foetus. This is the basis for the design of the lead apron, as the most important body parts are covered. With regard to the foetus, this is the reason why staff must let the employer know that they are pregnant. In these circumstances, a new, much lower annual dose limit of one millisievert then applies to that worker, one twentieth of the normal annual legal limit. The Radiation Protection Advisor for the practice must be consulted to ensure that a new, safe set of working practices are put in place in conjunction with a risk assessment to ensure that that worker does not exceed this new, lower dose limit. There is no safe level of exposure and no dose threshold and it is likely that any exposure will affect the probability of disease occurring at a later date so we have to be really vigilant in setting in place working practices which take this into account and keep the ALARP principle in mind all of the time. Unlike regulations designed, for instance, for the control of hazardous substances, which are familiar to all of us as the COSH regulations, we are dealing here with something we cannot be directly aware of, and yet which is potentially damaging, and we have to avoid. So how do we design a set of safeguards to minimise these risks? The first step on this path is to assess the potential risk from each step of the processes involved in the taking of a radiograph of a horse. In other words, to perform a risk assessment. Once the risks at every stage have been highlighted, then working practices can be designed which will minimise or even avoid these risks. These include factors like the engineering features of the X-ray machine itself, such as the lead cladding around the back of the tube head. This stops X-rays escaping from the tube head in any direction other than the path of the primary beam. Similarly, there is an aluminium filter interposed between the anode and the beam window which filters out soft X-rays. These low energy X-rays are useless for diagnostic imaging purposes but can produce extra scatter and for this reason they have to be filtered out. This is done with a simple sheet of aluminium as a standard part of all X-ray machines. These engineering features contribute to radiation protection from the outset and it's important that their integrity is checked from time to time by a skilled, suitably trained medical physicist. So make sure that your practice gets this done. We also make use of ancillary equipment like cassette holders and personal protective equipment like the lead aprons and gloves we wear to minimise the risks involved. Another problem with hazard avoidance in radiography is that there is a time delay between exposures to the x-rays and observable biological effects. For instance, the hair loss and reddening of the skin, which are symptoms of excessive exposure to x-ray, take several days or weeks to develop. Other effects on the body, such as increased risks of cancer, may even take many years to come home to roost. So, we are dealing with something we cannot directly perceive and the damage from which may not be immediately obvious. We have to remember though that all of this increase in possible risk of disease occurs in the face of very high background levels of cancer. The current statistics are that one in three people will die of cancer and one in eight women will develop breast cancer during their lives. In a normal, busy equine practice with a large staff it is not difficult to see that somebody working in the unit is likely to develop, to develop cancer. We have to ensure that their work with radiography has not contributed significantly to this risk. Every activity one does in life involves a degree of risk. Surprisingly, most of those activities also involve exposure to radiation, but this is the natural radiation which is around us all day, every day. Half a million cosmic rays, which originate from the sun, penetrate all of us every hour of every day. These cosmic rays are gamma rays and are just the same as those which leave the horse during a scintigraphic examination. This is the reason why the detector head of the gamma camera has to be housed within a lead protective shield so that the cosmic rays from the sun don't hit the crystal and degrade the quality of the image. 
The amount of radiation we receive from natural sources depends on where we live. For instance, a person living in Cornwall would receive an annual dose of around 7.8 millisieverts. Somebody living in London, in contrast, would receive about 2.1 millisieverts. To put this into perspective, the maximum allowable dose for someone working with radiography is 20 millisieverts. But someone receiving or expecting to receive a dose of 6 millisieverts would have to become what is known as a classified worker. You can easily see that somebody living in Cornwall, but not actually working in radiography, would receive a dose greater than the dose which would trigger the requirement for the introduction of classified worker status in a radiography department. This should give you some idea of the level of protection that the legislation is aiming to achieve. Without question, the main risk to staff in the equine radiography unit is the horse. Risk from radiation is classed as very low for the doses we would expect to receive in radiography and yet the risk from the horse is well quantified and is significant. So we have to design our working practices in a way which is a compromise between what's safe with respect to both the horse and the potential radiation hazards. For instance, we could use very long handled cassette holders and very long restraint ropes on the horse's head in order to get people away from the x-ray beam these would introduce a significant degree of risk for kick injuries to staff and poor restraint of the horse if we did. Everything we do in equine radiography is therefore designed as a compromise between the risk from the horse and the risk from radiation. To put these risks into context, it might be worth looking at statistics compiled by the health professionals. The risk of an individual person dying in any one year from a lightning strike is 1 in 10 million. From a railway accident, it's 1 in 500,000. As a comparison for someone receiving 1 millisievert of radiation, which actually would be a big dose in any one year working in equine radiography, the risk rises to 1 in 20,000. Now this might seem an unduly high risk until one looks at the figures for death in a road accident, which for us all in our normal lives comes out at 1 in 8,000. The risk of death following a dose of influenza is 1 in 5,000. So these figures themselves start to look alarming, but when you consider that the risk of an individual dying in any one year from smoking 10 cigarettes a day is 1 in 200, in other words, 100 times higher than receiving a fairly large dose of radiation, you can see that perceived risk doesn't always necessarily alter our behaviour in the way we might expect. So why do we need control measures? This radiograph was submitted to the surgeons at a referral equine hospital within the last couple of years and it shows that not only was the thumb not inside a lead glove but was actually lying within the margins of the primary beam. Clearly there's still a need for education and training in this area. Similarly this picture taken from the recent promotional literature for a digital x-ray system clearly shows the assistant holding the imaging tablet with his arms in the path of the primary beam. One would have hoped in the light of current legislation that the manufacturers of this equipment would have known better. The ionising radiation regulations are policed by the Health and Safety Executive or the HSE. They impose on employers certain obligations in order to protect their staff. One of these obligations is to register with the HSE in the first place as a user of ionising radiation. The employer also has to appoint a Radiation Protection Advisor, or ORPA. As its name suggests, this post ensures that the employer receives expert advice in the setting up of the X-ray facility in the first place, and also in its subsequent efficient running. It's the ORPA who will inspect the facility and make sure things are up to scratch, and we'll also look at the written systems of work and local rules to check that they are adequate for the facilities and equipment concerned. The RPA has to obtain a certain level of competence laid down by the Health and Safety Executive to do this job and you can rest assured that anyone acting as an RPA has come up to this standard. As well as employing an RPA in an advisory capacity, the employer also has to appoint a Radiation Protection Supervisor, or RPS. Large practices may have more than one RPS. 
The RPS is to be present at least during the majority of the work, although he or she need not be present on every occasion radiography is used. Just like the RPA, the RPS also has to achieve a certain level of competence and to undergo sufficient training to act in this capacity. The RPS also has to interact with the RPA in seeking advice when there is to be a change of equipment or working practices and to ensure that the written systems of work and local rules are satisfactory. The final interface comes between the RPS and the employee. It is the RPS's responsibility to make sure that employees receive sufficient training to allow them to work safely with radiation and to supervise their work on a regular enough basis to ensure that things are not allowed to drift. The final responsibility in this flow diagram rests with the employees themselves whose responsibility it is not only to read and understand all of the written systems of work and local rules, but also to report to the RPS any working practices which they feel may be unsafe, or any defect in equipment or personal protective clothing that they might have spotted. In addition, all staff are also under a legal obligation to report immediately in writing if they think they are or might be pregnant. Radiation is naturally occurring in the environment and can be spontaneous. An example of this would be radiation encountered, for instance, as radon gas in certain areas of the country, or radiation which occurs during the slow nuclear disintegration of substances like uranium, which are found naturally in some rocks. Radiation can also be generated artificially, and this is the basis of the X-rays generated in an X-ray machine. To produce X-rays, a tungsten filament is bombarded with electrons at high voltage. This causes the molecules in the tungsten to become excited to an abnormal level of energy and to move electrons in the atom into unstable positions. As these electrons return to their steady state, they release the acquired energy which is given off as X-rays. Another example of artificially induced radiation is the production of radioactive isotopes such as technetium which we use in bone scanning. In this case, molybdenum is bombarded in a special generator to produce an unstable isotope, technetium 99M. As the technetium decays back to molybdenum, it releases the energy initially stored in the form of gamma rays, and this forms the basis of the scintigraphic examination. Radiation exposure can be external or internal. An example of external radiation would be when part of the body is examined as part of a diagnostic X-ray examination. Internal radiation exposure follows the ingestion or inhalation of radioactive substances such as technetium used in bone scanning. During the radiographic examination, the X-rays are produced within the X-ray tube head. The tube head is designed in such a way that there is only one exit path for the X-rays and the remainder of the tube head is screened by lead to ensure that X-rays don't leak out in any other direction. It is now mandatory that the X-ray machine is fitted with a light beam diaphragm which will give fairly accurate guidance as to the path of the X-rays. The light beam diaphragm consists of a light bulb and a set of shutters which are lined up in such a way that the path of light exactly follows and mirrors the path of the X-rays. Light is obviously visible and X-rays are not, so the use of the light beam diaphragm allows us to see what part of the horse and, more importantly, what part of the cassette the X-rays will hit. Good radiographic practice dictates that the X-ray beam should never extend beyond the periphery of the cassette, as well as the primary radiation beam which follows the path of the light beam we can see, secondary radiation is produced when the X-rays hit the horse and the X-ray cassette. This is called scattered radiation and it shoots off in all directions, including back towards the source of the X-rays. The person standing behind the tube head will still be in the scatter zone, even though the primary beam is heading away from them. Scattered radiation is relatively low in energy and is easily stopped by only fractions of a millimetre of lead. It's the scattered radiation which lead aprons and gloves are designed to protect the body against. The major danger zone for scatter around the horse being radiographed is about 2 metres in diameter, so this is the zone that is regarded as a controlled area. If at all possible, people should not be present in this zone, 
but if they are present, they must wear lead containing personal protective equipment. Although scattered radiation is easily stopped by a thin layer of lead, it does possess enough energy to penetrate and harm unguarded tissues, so it must be taken seriously. There are only four primary ways in which the radiation dose incurred in radiography can be reduced. These are by the use of good working practices, by restricting the time of exposure, by increasing the distance between the source of the radiation and yourself, and by the use of shielding. So let's consider each of these in turn. Good working practices involve the use of warning lights at the access point to radiography to make sure that nobody walks in during the examination without wearing protective clothing. Inside the x-ray room itself, the system of work should be drawn up in conjunction with both the RPS and the RPA to make sure that everyone is in the right position and that nobody is being exposed unnecessarily to radiation hazard. The local rules should also specify the correct use and storage of the personal protective equipment. The written system of work is exactly what its name suggests. The idea of this work scheme is that anybody who is new and is unused to working in the department could read the system of work and should have a good idea of how they should behave during radiography. All staff members should therefore have read the system of work and understand it in full before commencing work in radiography. The system of work should include the detailed arrangements for all of the radiographic examinations which are going to be undertaken. They should include advice on safety features and warning devices used and notification of who is both the radiation protection supervisor and the radiation protection advisor for the practice. The system of work has to be on display at all times in the x-ray facility along with the local rules and pinning a bunch of papers up by a drawing pin in one corner just isn't good enough. This information has to be displayed on a notice board in a way which makes sure that it can be easily read. The local rules, again, are exactly what they sound like. These are rules drawn up in conjunction with the RPA and specific to the local site involved. It is not possible to have a generic set of local rules for all X-ray facilities as the circumstances of each room the architectural arrangement of the walls, the direction and path of the primary beam and the access points to the room are going to differ from place to place. It is vital therefore that local rules are just that, in other words, local to the situation. Good radiographic technique also feeds through directly on radiation doses received by staff. The light beam diaphragm should be used to collimate the primary beam so that all four borders are visible on the cassettes. This ensures that the primary beam does not continue to diverge outside the borders of the cassette and hit staff members. Be fussy about positioning. Retaking a radiograph because the positioning is incorrect effectively doubles the radiation hazard for that view, so we should avoid retakes if at all possible. Adequate restraint of the horse is important here to reduce unwanted movement, which can be a major source of the need for retakes. The horse should be restrained by a bridle when brought into the radiography room. A head collar and rope is just not sufficient or safe. If you're going to radiograph the head, then a soft rope head collar, which won't show on the final image, can be fitted after sedation of the horse and removal of the bridle. Almost always sedation will be required for safe equine radiography. The dose of sedative involved can be small and on rare occasions it might be possible to carry out radiography without sedation but you should seek advice on this from the radiation protection supervisor on an individual basis. Bear in mind that the major source of risk in the radiography room is the horse. Great care should be taken before thrusting cassettes into the area inside the hind legs. You should acclimatise the horse to touching by repeated stroking of the intended final position of the cassette before you position the cassette. Also be aware of the fact that handles and extensions on cassette holders, whilst removing you from the risk of the primary beam, can increase the risk of your getting kicked by inadvertent contact with the horse's legs. Radiography takes place in what's known as a controlled area. Again, the name tells all. 
and that the sole basis for the controlled area is that access to the area is actively controlled. The controlled area shouldn't form a thoroughfare, therefore, to any other site. It should be a dead end, a cul-de-sac with a direct access door, which is marked with the radiation trefoil and bears the warning light for when the tube head is activated. For cleaning and maintenance of the room, the controlled area is no longer considered a controlled area when the main power switch is turned off. A controlled area is defined as an area in which staff will have to take special precautions and work in specified ways to avoid exposure to radiation. Any area in which the dose rate might reach or exceed 7.5 microsieverts an hour has to be designated and clearly identified as a controlled area and should be identified to the rest of the practice by the use of suitable warning signs. In the field, a temporary controlled area can be set up for radiography and this zone needs to be marked by the use of a portable sign warning people not to walk into the area during a radiographic examination. Where a horse is stabled in wooden stables, the wooden walls are no barrier at all to the x-rays but they do prevent us from seeing if anyone's in the path of the x-ray beam and so the beam shouldn't be directed at these walls. In this situation, it's much safer to take the horse out of the stable and to carry out radiography in the open air. Here the beam can be directed into open space which can be kept under con continuous visual supervision throughout the making of the exposure. The radiation risk itself diminishes significantly with increasing distance from the tube head and outside a zone approximately 20 metres from the tube head it would be negligible at the exposure factors used for equine field radiography. In the clinic, the controlled areas usually consist of a designated radiography room. The features of this room should include effective methods of restricting entry, construction of the walls of a material which will not allow escape of x-rays during radiography, warning lights at the entrance and warning signs on the doors. Everybody working in the controlled area must be monitored for possible radiation exposure by some sort of detection badge which we'll talk about later. A suitable system will be advised on by the RPA. The written system of work and local rules should be kept under review and the date of each review should be clearly marked on the rules to show that it's been done. It's suggested that this is carried out annually as a routine. In the event of a change of equipment or procedures then the review should be more frequent and should be done in conjunction with the RPA. All x-ray sets, including small portables, have to be serviced annually and it's important that the service records are kept for inspection. In addition to these routine maintenance checks, the engineering features of the machine must be checked by medical physicists at appropriate intervals to monitor for tube head leakage. Your RPA will advise on the frequency of these checks, but every three or four years is usually sufficient. The records of both the annual maintenance and the engineering feature checks must be maintained in the practice for inspection. The radiation dose received is directly proportional to the duration of the exposure to radiation. So the reduction of the time radiation is used is one of the basic steps which can be taken in dose limitation. It follows then that we have to use a minimum exposure time possible in every case. This can be achieved by the use of modern, very fast, rare earth cassettes when using film radiography or even the use of digital radiography. Careful radiographic technique avoiding repeat exposures would also limit the duration of exposure so that only those who have received thorough training in radiographic technique should be put in charge of the tube head. This should ensure that all radiographs obtained are of diagnostic quality. Do take care with patient preparation. Spend time brushing off dirt, picking out the feet before commencing radiography so that you don't have to take a retake because the view was spoiled by an artifact on the final image. Ionizing radiation follows the inverse square law. This means that doubling the distance between the point source and a staff member reduces the dose rate received by that person by four times. Increasing your distance from the primary x-ray source as well as from the area under investigation is always a basic tenet of good working practice. 
This increase in distance can be achieved by the use of freestanding cassettes, holding blocks for areas near the ground such as feet or fetlocks, or cassette holders with long handles in the more proximal joints. The areas of the horse where there is a thick soft tissue component such as the shoulder, stifle and back produce more scattered radiation than the distal limb and freestanding cassette stands should be used if possible so no one needs to hold the cassette. The stifle probably presents the most difficult site as the potential danger from the horse increases given the position of the x-ray cassette and cassettes much larger than the image required should be used here in conjunction with tight collimation of the beam to get hands well away from the primary beam. The groom holding the horse's head should also make sure that just prior to exposure they take a step away from the horse to increase the distance from the source of scatter. For radiography of the hind limb it's paramount again just prior to the exposure that the radiographer checks that the horse holder is not standing in the path of the primary beam. Using combinations of cassette holders and careful positioning of staff it's possible to radiograph all the areas of the horse in comparative safety. Shielding takes several forms and is the final link in the chain of dose reduction. The x-ray tube head, as we've already discussed, is surrounded by lead shielding so that only the intended beam, defined by the extent of the light beam diaphragm, escapes from the head. In addition to this, the soft radiation produced, which is of no diagnostic value, is filtered out by the aluminium filter we've also described. The primary beam should only be pointed at a target wall which offers complete absorption of the radiation. Concrete block and brick is satisfactory for these purposes, but the lighter breeze blocks often used in building and construction are not, and they'll allow significant passage of x-rays. The RPA should be consulted during the construction of any radiographic facility. If there's any doubt over the efficiency of the retaining walls, then lead back plywood will have to be applied to the inside of the wall to achieve complete containment. For brickwork and open concrete, or plasterboard and stud work, an alternative is the application of barium impregnated plaster. If you are thinking of using this material, however, you have to consult with your radiation protection advisor over the adequate thickness of barium impregnated plaster to achieve effective screening of the x-rays. The same principle is used on the backing for wooden doors in and out of the unit. Freestanding lead shields can also be employed for staff to stand behind temporarily during exposures where a lot of scatter will be produced, such as in radiography of the spine in the standing conscious horse. Finally, shielding is achieved by the use of lead aprons, gloves, thyroid collars, and if necessary, lead glasses, which form the working category of personal protective equipment, which we're now going to go on to look at. The lead aprons and gloves which we wear within the controlled area are only designed to protect against scattered radiation and offer little protection against the primary beam. The personal protective equipment must be approved by the radiation protection advisor as being suitable for the job and the circumstances in which it's going to be used. The RPA has to be consulted over this and will decide on the thickness of lead equivalent needed to offer enough protection. Gowns should be worn by everybody within the controlled area. Gloves should be worn by anyone within two metres of the primary beam who is supporting a limb or using a cassette holder. Thyroid collars are also now light and comfortable and should be worn by everybody who has to stand within two metres of the primary beam. Although lead goggles are theoretically of value in protecting the eyes, they're quite heavy and cumbersome to wear and not popular with staff. An individual risk assessment carried out in conjunction with your RPA may well help in deciding whether or not these are necessary. To do this, carry out a dose assessment using an extremity dose meter attached to the outside of the glasses for a two month period. The dose you record will give you an idea of whether lead glasses would be helpful or not. As with all dose monitoring, the records of this assessment period should be retained for at least four years. To make sure that the personal protective equipment is protective, 
it's essential that the gowns and gloves are examined for signs of damage on a regular basis. The gowns should be examined visually for splits and tears at least four times a year and a written record kept of these examinations. This is quickly and easily done if the gowns are identified and numbered ready for checking. These written records have to be kept for, available for inspection for at least four years. In addition to these quarterly visual checks, the gowns have to be tested for x-ray leakage at least once a year. This is done by laying the gown down over a large radiographic film and carrying out a test exposure. Do remember though that the gowns don't offer protection against the primary beam, so you'll expect to get an image produced on the cassette. What you're looking for is areas of increased penetration which may signify splits in the lead rubber within the gown which you might not see because of the protective plastic covers. X-ray gowns and gloves should be stored in a way which doesn't encourage splitting and damage. The gown should be hung over specially designed hanging rails and should never be folded. The gloves should be stored in a way which allows air to circulate within the glove so that the sweat which inevitably accumulates during working dries off. This will prevent the rubber from perishing and splitting. Radiographic records of the annual gown x-ray leakage test also have to be kept for inspection, again for at least four years. Some of the Skyland projections used in Equine Radiography present particular problems in protection of staff from the x-ray beam. Most of these require extremely careful collimation of the primary beam as well as methods of limb support which will remove staff from the immediate vicinity of the site under study. Skyland pro projections of the distal metacarpus or distal metatarsus can be achieved by a combination of foot blocks, long handled cassette holders and careful positioning. Skyline projections of the third carpal bone, which is an important view in the radiographic examination of the carpus, can also be carried out safely by the use of a cassette holder in association with careful positioning. The radiographer should always check that the primary beam is collimated tightly and that the radiography assistant's feet and limbs are not allowed to lie within the eventual path of the primary beam. This is particularly important in the distal skyline view of the radius. Skyline pro projections of the navicular bone highlighting the flexor surface are another important radiographic view. These can be safely achieved by the use of a cassette tunnel. You should also be aware though that in this view the major risk is from the horse. Inadvertent touching of the horse with the tube head which is positioned under the belly and in front of the hind legs can result in a kick. This radiographic view requires sedation and great care to be carried out safely. Everybody working in a radiography unit should wear a film badge or some other dose recording device of some sort. If members of the public, such as horse owners, are going to be allowed into the unit, then an assessment of the risk to them should be carried out in advance in conjunction with the RPA. They may decide that one film badge to be worn in rotation by horse owners is acceptable as long as the film badge reading is always very low. The prior risk assessment should also have estimated that the dose of these horse holders will not exceed the annual 1 millisievert limit, which is the dose limit for the general population. Alternatively, some other form of electronic personal dose meter could be used. These give an instant readout during any one radiographic examination, and the resultant doses can be recorded for each individual horse holder. Whatever method is chosen, if members of the public are allowed to hold horses, they must have the risks of radiation explained to them and they must give informed consent, signed, to consent to their involvement. They must be over 18 years of age, not be pregnant and they must wear the same personal protective equipment as worn by the staff. For all of these reasons it's often a lot easier in the long run to have a policy that horses are not held by owners. For workers within the unit a routine method of dose recording is essential. This can take the form either of film badges or thermoluminescent dose meters. The radiation protection advisor will advise on a suitable badge and on the badge reading interval. This is usually every, every one to two months in a busy equine practice. Film badges should be individually allocated to staff and should never be shared between staff. 
Any high film badge reading should be brought to the attention of the Radiation Protection Supervisor immediately and should automatically trigger an internal investigation over how this reading might have been incurred. Make sure that these dose meters are stored correctly out of hours. Never leave them in the radiography room and never expose them to heat, chemicals or worst of all, the inside of a washing machine. If you do inadvertently wash the film badge, you will almost certainly have an erroneously high reading on the badge and you should alert the dosimetry service that the badge has been put through the wash prior to submitting it for dose assessment. The film badge should be worn on the body underneath any lead protective equipment. If extremity dose meters are used for the hands, then again these are worn inside the lead gloves. It's a good idea to monitor the exposure of the extremities for a two month period every three or four years to make sure that the working practices drawn up by your RPA are still safe and effective. As with most other aspects of radiation protection data, the results of this two month test period should be retained on file for inspection by the health and safety executive should they choose to visit the practice. One of the duties of the employer outlined in the 1999 regulations is to ensure that everybody working within the radiography unit is adequately trained for the job. They also have to be aware of the risks and hazards involved and, more importantly, how to avoid them. Staff training is therefore absolutely mandatory. Nobody should be asked to or expected to work within a radiography unit without this guidance. Training can take the form of a talk from the Radiation Protection Supervisor or from reading the written systems of work and local rules or even from watching a training presentation such as this one. But the most important aspect is that staff truly understand the risks involved and have a good working knowledge of how to avoid these risks. Every aspect of the training should refer back again and again to the basis of the ALARP principle. That is, if it's possible to reduce a dose by taking any practicable action, then the action must and should be taken. However, once all of the steps are in place to minimise the dose received by staff, then rotation of staff within the unit is a sensible next step. This ensures that the tiny end dose, which is not reducible any further, will be spread between as many people as possible, ensuring that each individual person receives an even smaller dose. It is important though to understand that staff rotation should never be used to artificially lower what would otherwise be unacceptably higher film badge readings if they'd occurred on an individual staff member. In other words, once the minimum possible is achieved, then rotation is a practical and sensible way of making sure that the doses are even smaller, but it should never be the main method of achieving low film badge readings. Whatever form the staff training takes, it should cover the safe working practices which form the basis of the written system of work and the local rules. It should also instruct you on the use of the positioning aids available in the radiography unit and how to use these aids to make sure that you are well away from the danger zone. It needs to cover your use of personal protective equipment, how to store this equipment and how to check that the equipment is not damaged. It needs to inform you of control measures to take in the event of an emergency such as malfunctioning of the tube head or accidental damage to the head for instance following a kick from a horse. The training programme should go through in detail the ALARP principle and make sure that everyone is aware of the way in which potential doses are lowered and it should spell out in detail the basic tenets of radiation protection again and again which are good working practices and local rules and time, distance and shielding. There are a few duties which actually fall on the employees themselves these include making full and proper use of the personal protective equipment provided, reporting any defects that they've seen in this equipment or in the x-ray machines being used to the radiation protection supervisor, and storing the personal protective equipment properly after use so that it doesn't get damaged. They should also cooperate on the proper use of dose meters and their regular return for dose reading. Staff should also be aware of the fact that they must report any, anything they see which may be dangerous, both in terms of working practices or damage to equipment, to the RPS immediately. As we've said before, female employees must notify the RPS in writing 
as soon as they are aware that they are, or even might be, pregnant. Scintigraphy involves its own special hazards because of the open nature of the radiation source. The potential for inadvertent contamination is obviously large when the radioactive chemical looks just like water and is easily spilled. Again, there's no way of detecting that radiation has been spread around the premises without the use of specialised equipment, and we'll go on later to see how this equipment should be used correctly. Unlike the situation with the use of diagnostic x-rays, where the risk is purely from an external, easily identifiable source, when using liquid isotopes there is the added risk from the inhalation or ingestion of the isotope. Once inside the body, the isotope continues to decay, leading to a potentially prolonged exposure time. For this reason, we must always wear disposable gloves and protective clothing when working with isotopes or contaminated bedding. Eating, drinking and smoking in the working environment in an equine scintigraphy unit should also be strictly forbidden. In terms of dose reduction, the principles remain exactly the same as those for x-rays. In other words, we depend exclusively on time, distance, shielding and good working practices to limit staff exposure. So let's now look at each of these in turn. Isotope handling presents the biggest risk period for exposure because all of the activity is contained within the syringe and is close to the staff member handling the isotope. For this reason, confident and experienced personnel only should be used for injection of the horse. Try to conduct the injections in a slick and practiced routine to keep the time when the syringe is handheld to the minimum. In the scintigraphy room during the scan, you should try to keep the scanning procedures as short as possible and develop a slick and efficient way of carrying out a systematic bone scan on the horse. Get in the habit of standing away from the horse at all times. It's very easy to find yourself cradling the head of a sedated horse, and this shouldn't be done. Despite your worst fears, allowing the head to sag will not result in the horse collapsing, and most sedated horses reach a steady state when allowed to do so, supporting their own heads. In the scintigraphic examination of the head itself, where it's essential for the head to be still, then a purpose-built headstand or chin rest should be used. Remember the inverse square law. Double the distance and you quarter the received dose rate, so get in the habit of taking that extra step away whenever possible. The isotope usually arrives from the hospital radiopharmacy contained within a lead pot. Isotope should be drawn up through a perforated vial cap using a lead syringe shield so that the dose received by the hand is minimised. It's also good practice to use a syringe which is at least double the size of the intended dose so that the fingers at the far end of the syringe are as far away from the bolus of isotope as possible. A lead apron should be worn by the horse handler to reduce the body dose of radiation. Lead aprons can be worn by others in the scintigraphy unit but these staff are usually at a much greater distance from the horse and may choose not to wear personal protective equipment. You should go through your intended protocols with your RPA and seek approval for this in advance. Handling of isotopes should be done in a secure area which is classified as a supervised area. In contrast to a controlled area, a supervised area is one where the received dose rate would not normally be expected to rise over 7.5 microsieverts an hour, but in which supervision is necessary to make sure that this doesn't happen. The radio pharmacy should be a dead-end cul-de-sac room which is not accessed for other purposes, but if other doors do access into that area then they should be fitted with bolts on the inside so that these doors can be secured prior to handling of isotopes. Before the vial is open, you should put on protective overalls and disposable gloves. The injection tray should be prepared ready for use, so that once the isotope vial is opened, delays are kept to an absolute minimum. Disposable bench coats should be used on the workbench, so that if any isotope is spilled, the bench coat can simply be rolled up, bagged and labelled with a date. This can then be left stored in a locked metal cabinet somewhere until normal disposal in the refuse is safe. 
for instance, about a week later. Before disposal in normal refuse, the activity level of the low-level waste should be checked and should be no more than twice the background. The person drawing up the radioisotope should wear an extremity dose monitor on the wrist underneath their rubber protective gloves to make sure that the working practices they're using are not resulting in excessive extremity doses. Once the isotopes are drawn up, then all of the fresh waste should be bagged, dated and stored within a lead pot for not less than seven days prior to disposal in the normal waste routes. Again, get into the habit of checking the dose rate from this waste prior to disposal. Only when all the waste has been disposed of in the storage receptacles should, re should you remove your disposable gloves and these are stored in the same lead pot. You should then put on a fresh pair of gloves so that when you're monitoring the bench area you don't contaminate your hands again if spillage has occurred. To monitor the bench area you will require two distinct types of radiation monitor. The first is a contamination meter. This is a photomultiplier tube which is extremely sensitive to radiation but gives you no indication whatsoever of the actual amount of radiation involved. Its job is simply to seek out tiny amounts of radiation and magnify them enormously so that you can be aware of where they are. Once the spillage hotspot has been found, then the radiation dose meter should be used. This instrument has a fairly long lag period before registering a reading. It's therefore useless for finding contamination, but its main purpose is to measure the dose rate of radiation given off by the hotspot. If the dose is more than twice background, and certainly if the dose is above 7.5 microsieverts an hour, then steps have to be taken to reduce the contamination. Before you do this, you should put on a complete protective clothing outfit. Use a proprietary band of a decontamination fluid to decontaminate the area. Remember that these products will only loosen the isotope from the surface, and the spillage will still have to be mopped up in absorbent paper toweling or cloths which themselves will have to be stored to allow sufficient decay for safe disposal in the normal refuse. Once the isotope is in the horse, the stable containing the horse becomes a controlled area as the dose received in the vicinity of the horse could well exceed 7.5 microsieverts an hour. Access to the stable should therefore be kept to an absolute minimum and feed, hay and water put in through the door rather than being deposited in mangers at the back of the stable. Anybody entering the stable must wear overshoes and overall and disposable gloves which should be taken off immediately after leaving the stable. The horse should not be groomed or mocked out for 48 hours following injection of isotope. Once the bedding is removed from the stable it should be stored on site for at least a further 24 hours or until the radioactivity level is less than twice background before being mixed with a large volume of non-radioactive waste for eventual disposal in the normal waste routes. Up to a half of the injected dose can be eliminated in the urine. If the horse urinates in the centigraphy room then a set emergency procedure should be carried out. This should be written down as one of the systems of work and well rehearsed in advance. It should require the immediate removal from the room of the horse back to its stable. Staff should then don overalls, overshoes and disposable gloves and the urine spill should immediately be covered with cat litter. This should be left in place for 10 or 15 minutes to allow complete absorption. The cat litter should then be swept up and placed in a clinical waste bag marked with a radiation trefoil. This bag should be stored in a locked metal receptacle for a period of seven days before disposal in the normal waste routes. Once the majority of the voided urine has been cleaned up, then a mop and buck bucket should be used with a solution of decontamination fluid to mop up the last traces. The water in the bucket will obviously become radioactive during this procedure and again the bucket and mop must be stored safely somewhere for a period of approximately six half-lives before disposal in the normal sewage. Only when the radiation level at the site of the spill is reduced to twice background should scanning recommence. 
Once the horse is injected, it should be regarded as a controlled area and the zone for at least a metre around the horse, an exclusion zone for all but necessary handling. It follows then that we need to use ancillary aids to screen out the contralateral limb in distal limb views. Freestanding lead screens are usually used for this to ensure no one has to hold these screens in place. Similarly, for views of the neck, a freestanding chin rest should be used to keep the head and neck still. If you want to image the head itself, for instance, to look at the teeth roots, then a supporting shelf that sits on the front of the camera should be constructed so that this can be done in safety without having to hold the head. The time involved in the scan is directly linked to the received dose of the staff and discussions should take place between the staff, clinicians and the RPA over an appropriate count period. In theory, an acquisition of 500,000 counts will have a superior quality to one of 100,000 counts. However, in real life, the expected advantage doesn't materialise because the prolonged count period introduces a degree of movement blur which will counteract the expected improvement in quality. Even with movement correction software, the minimum window size for one frame of data is approximately 2 or 3 seconds and significant movement can occur within this window which will not be corrected. You should have detailed discussions with your clinicians and with your radiation protection advisor to come to a compromise between image quality and radiation safety. In the event of a spillage of isotopes, such as dropping a loaded syringe during injection, then another well-rehearsed action plan should roll into operation. The details of this plan should be contained within the written system of work for the premises and should be understood by all staff handling isotopes. The first step to take is to remove the horse from the vicinity of the spillage and put it in another stable. The area of the spillage then needs to be cordoned off with warning tape and absorbent waste remover such as cat litter tipped over the spillage in a pile. Following this the staff members concerned should leave the scene so that they can put on overshoes, gloves and an overall before starting to clear up the spillage. It's important to leave the cat litter in situ for at least 10 or 15 minutes to absorb all of the spilled liquid and then sweep it up into a clinical waste bag which should be marked clearly with a radiation trefoil. This should be kept in a locked metal container until the activity is less than twice background and this is normally going to take between 3 to 5 days. Once the cat litter is removed the area should be monitored for contamination and the radiation dose meter used to assess the dose rate at the site of the spillage. If this is greater than 7.5 microsieverts an hour, then the area is still classified as a controlled area, and decontamination fluid should be used in conjunction with a mop and bucket to reduce the radiation levels until they're acceptable. If this isn't possible for any reason, maybe because there's poor access to the site of the spillage or the liquid is run underneath something which prevents access, then cordon tape should be left up until six half-lives, that's 36 hours, after the spillage has occurred, when radiation levels will be returning to background.